guys i am driving but i want to try to help answer a question um the sun sorry the sun's just weird so i'm gonna hold it over here <laughs> um so i gotta watch the road but so a lot of people have been kind of poking at me asking questions because i in the last i'll give you some background i grew up assemblies of god i went to a private christian college i was very active in at the next stop sign turn right in ministry um sorry my gps in ministry at a, a mega church for all intents and purposes i mean 10 12 15 000 members kind of church right um choreography and um music and kids stuff and um so my entire life was mainstream christianity 100 percent buy-in and where that left me was looking a lot like the world, living a lot like the world, but trying to be a good person, pray when I needed something, and, you know. At this stop sign, turn right onto Route 413. And, like, be generous, be good, but I was still, like, I was not covenanted. I had no idea what covenant meant. I thought that an entire part of my Bible, the eternal word of Yahuwah, God, I thought it was done away with, as if it could be, right? Otherwise, it's not eternal. Um, but so, I was the mainstream, I was your picture perfect Christian gal. Um, and it, it's a life... In about six and a half miles, turn right onto North Commerce Street. It's a life of compromise, right? It's really what I truly believe Christianity is at this point. Because you can still dress kind of slutty sometimes when, when everybody else is doing it. You can still like go out and get a little little too tipsy with your friends and it's fine. And you can, you know, I mean, you could just do all the, all the worldly things, right? But you're like, it's all under grace. Like I said the prayer, I'm good, right? Um, and so about eight years ago now, I realized the lies, the hypocrisy, the deception um, and a lot of sincere people I was sincere but sincerely wrong just ignorant of biblical truth ignorant of an understanding of covenant and what our father in heaven really truly expects of us if we are his set apart people for his glory right and so just to give you that background now I keep the feasts I am learning how to live covenanted with my heavenly father and you know it's like you're unlearning stuff as much as you're learning stuff and it's like side by side sometimes um there's always a breaking down before there's a building up and there's a lot of times more questions than answers and questions are really looked down upon in mainstream christian church <laughs> it's like and there's a couple of things this is a good segue that you don't question you don't question the virgin birth, you don't question the Trinity, and you definitely don't question the divinity of Christ. Because you're not a Christian if you deny those things. You're a heretic, right? You believe in opposition to Orthodox Christian views and values. And I will tell you, I'm gladly a heretic because I am not a Christian. <laughs> because I believe that the religion of Christianity uses a misinterpretation of scripture intended or not I think I mean obviously the mistranslated parts in scripture are purposeful by the people that are paying for them but as far as boots on the ground a lot of pastors and a lot of like church people I don't think they mean to right it says we've inherited lies and we're destroyed for a lack of knowledge um, not for a lack of good intentions right in scripture and so um, you know we're sincere and sincerely wrong and Christianity I believe like teaches people how to be Christians they don't teach people how to live in biblical covenant with Yahuwah our Heavenly Father and so I kind of want to un unpack what how I can explain it again like you take this and test this for yourself because is the other thing that I, I don't like pastors will talk about stuff and they're like this is how it is and you don't question that and if you do you're kind of ignored or brushed to the side or sometimes you can be asked to leave they, they they don't like their neat little theology they can tie up with a bow poked on right um and that's pride that is absolutely pride even if people don't mean to be 
or know that they're being prideful, they are. Because um, we're supposed to test everything. We're supposed to study as Bereans. And do you think Yahuwah, our Heavenly Father, is scared of our questions? No, nah, he's not. Because truth stands, no matter how much it's tested. It's the lies that don't want to be tested because they know they're going to be found lacking, right? So that in and of itself, and people aren't consciously maybe trying to deceive or do that, but it's the spirit of deception that is operating in these lies continuing to be propagated um, that, that it puffs up in people and they don't even know it. I didn't even know it because at first I, I defended what I believed tooth and nail until I humbly was willing to go back to the drawing board and be like, okay, let y'all be true and every man a liar. So let's, let's see what I believe uh, and it, how much of it is Bible. And there was a very slim part of it that was, honestly. And so, um, when we look at things like, and that just brings me to why I'm asking questions about certain things, about maybe four to five, five to six, somewhere in the last four to six years. I honestly really can't tell you when these questions started. And, um, you know, my aim, I'm not trying to teach someone to, to walk in a religion. I want to teach people to study, to question, to test, to own their faith biblically from the Bible. Not from doctrines of men, not from pillars somebody made up, none of that stuff, right? And so this is not, I don't, I don't want to teach somebody how to be a good Christian because I, I think Christianity opposes the Bible in so many ways. And I'm very happy and glad and openly a heretic against Christianity and Judaism and whatever other orthodox school of thought is out there um, because I'm trying to get back to Bible things in Bible ways and every religion has some truth and some lie mixed together and that's the point because when you have it mixed together when you have that mixture which is why Yahuwah says so many times not to mix the holy and the profane it's hard to tell it apart you start believing lies or truth and truth or lies because you don't know what's what right you don't know up from down and so um, I started questioning those big three things, those big pillars of Christian belief, the virgin birth, the, um, the Trinity, as far as there's three gods in one, essentially. I'm like, that sounds quite polytheistic in a weird way. Um, and then, you know, the divinity of Christ which is not something you'll even find in scripture. You won't. In half a mile, turn right onto North Commerce Street. And so, um, here's the way that I can explain these things in a short video. And again, there's going to be a lot of people that disagree. There's a lot of people that are like, blasphemy. And I'm like, it's interesting because the same spirit of deception, what the spirit of deception does is it gaslights you. It tells you you're doing the thing that it's actually doing, right? We saw this with all the COVID BS. Um, when they were like, it's it's a manipulative, like Jezebel type spirit. Um, and so- Turn right onto North Commerce Street. If you don't do these things, you don't get to be in the cool kids club. If you don't believe in the Trinity, the Immaculate Conception and Virgin Birth and the Divinity- In about right 10 miles, turn right onto Route 413. If you don't wear a mask, you're gonna kill grandma. If you don't get the shot, you don't get to go to a concert. Hello, people. It's the same spirit. It's the same one. It's manipulation. And it's like playing on the heartstrings of people that don't want to be left out. And I'm like, please leave me out. I don't want to be a part of that group. Very happy where I am. <laughs> I've, I've gone through hell to get to where I am. Trust me. Um, and I'm not going back to Egypt. I'm not, I'm not going back into Babylonian captivity. I don't want to be yoked with her any longer and her religions and her her stuff like I could go on but so um as far as the virgin birth goes the word alma which is the word used for Mary for virgin there's also a word betula which is different um but it, it basically means a young maiden um who hasn't yet menstruated um not necessarily somebody who hasn't had sex and so if you're like, well, which side of the coin is it? Because it kind of could mean somebody that hasn't had sex. But if that's not the case, and it does just mean someone who hasn't yet menstruated, then, okay, well, what? How, how do we know? So we need to look at the context of the rest of what's going on in this passage. I'm going to pull over at the gas station here. Um, and so 
Joseph. Turn right, then turn right. Joseph. Proceed to the route. <laughs> Stop and for gas, Siri. Go past this stop sign. Then at the next one, turn right onto Route 413. Oh, wait, I'm trying to do something of note. Not today, Satan. But so, um, when, when Hebrews got married, right? So, um, Mary and Joseph were from the tribe of Yehuda. There were no Jews back then. There wasn't even a letter J to call them Jews. They were just simply of the tribe of Yehuda. And yes, there was rabbinical Judaism up and coming that wasn't really called that yet. Um, and that's what Yeshua, Yehusha, uh, Messiah, I used to say Yeshua and I, that's a whole other conversation of why I pronounce it differently. Just further study. Um, they, they follow the commandments right? Yahushua Messiah rebuked the Pharisees for their religion, for their rabbinical Judaism, as it would later be known, over and over again, adding to the Torah, right? The loving instructions of Yahuwah, God. And so, um, so they were of the Yahudi tribe. They were following the Torah and in a Hebrew marriage, when you're betrothed, you're married. So it was like serious. So you would have like the bride price be paid. They would consummate the marriage. Um, and this is just like historical stuff that I researched. Um, you can go look it up also. Don't take my word for it. Um, but then he would go, the, the groom prepare a place. Then they would come back together for like the wedding feast. Um, so, and they would come, they would come together. When we see that in scripture, Joseph and Mary hadn't yet come together. It was for the wedding feast, y'all. Um, but in order for them to be married and Joseph to have to put her away or divorce her, they would have had to consummate it. Otherwise he, there would be no need for a divorce. He could just be like, mm, sorry about you. But you have to realize everything was very formal, um, very like covenant based. <laughs> And so if you're, if you say you're intending to marry someone, then you go through everything and before you even have the public feast, like y'all are married. And so it would be very miraculous if they had been together one time and she do, she's young enough, probably 14 ish, maybe 15 ish back then. And they didn't have all those preservatives in their food. So girls weren't getting their period at age nine. Um, and so she probably, she hadn't menstruated yet. Alma. And it'd be very miraculous for her to become pregnant on her first time. And Joseph's like, does she have something on the side? Is she not a virgin? Is she doing stuff outside of like our covenant agreement? And so he struggles with this, obviously, because he doubted. If they had not been together, there would be zero reason to doubt if it was his or not right? Because there'd be zero chance it was his. So that alone, the fact that he wrestled with this and he knew Torah, he followed Torah. And if you're going to accuse someone of adultery, which it would have been because they were married, because they consummated the marriage. If you're going to accuse somebody of adultery, there's a couple things that got to happen. It's got to be in the court of the Sanhedrin. It's not just the woman that you accuse. You have to accuse the man also. He had no one. And you have to have two to three credible witnesses right? This is like, again, formal, vetted out stuff. The way that they lived was super intentional. Not a whole, like, not a whole lot like we live today. So there's, there's hardly any accountability today for anything, right? Which is part of the problem. Like we try to read the Bible with this Western modern day mindset. <laughs> and that is not the people that were in it and the people that were writing it and who they were writing it to. Um, so anywho, so the angel of, the, of, of Yahuwah comes and, and says, dude, like, you don't have to, you don't have to put her away because he was going to put her away secretly. Right. And that's because he knew he didn't have a great case and he was just kind of like unsure. And it was weird that she was pregnant so quick. So he's going to put away her secretly to avoid the risk of if he was wrong, if she drinks the bitter herbs in the court of the Sanhedrin and she has not committed adultery, guess who gets stoned? The person who wrongly accused, which would have been Joseph. Yeah. So he's like, I'm, I'm not so sure that I'm willing to put my neck on the line for that. So I'm just going to put her away privately. I'm just going to do a little like 
Ooh, divorce on the DL, right? Um, but the angel of Yahuwah is like, no, dude, like it's, it's good. She's good. It's yours. This is the favor of Yahuwah whose favor is on every conception. Every conception is miraculous. It's not immaculate, but it's miraculous, right? And there's others like um, John the Baptist, and there's like five or six um, miraculous conceptions in scripture that are listed. And so, so there's that part of it. Um, plus, prophetically, having the physical DNA of Joseph and Mary has a lot to do playing into... Um, the priest and the priesthood and the, the, pro the prophet and all of that, like all of the hats that Yahusha Messiah wears, <laughs> he has to have both lines of DNA, um, for, for that prophecy to be fulfilled. Um, so then we come to, um, the Trinity and the Trinity verse, and I forget, is it in Mark? Um, for anybody, I will put the link to that video in the description of this one. Um, but it was literally added when it talks about three in one, um, God and three persons, blessed Trinity, you know, that, that song that we sing kind of without knowing what it means. Um, and so think, so the word echad in Hebrew, that means one, it is the same um, it's high, I forget the Greek word when we, when we see it in Ephesians talking about marriage, think about this man and wife two become one flesh. The equivalent of that Greek word is a chad in Hebrew. And that does not mean that you are the same DNA, the same person. You are still two very separate people, but you are unified in purpose. And you are covenanted together going in the same direction. That is how it is with Yahuwah and Yahusha. And you will see if you actually get a Bible old enough to where the names are in there, you will see Yahuwah and Yahusha very separate in scripture. Now, translators with an agenda purposefully used a blanket term of Adonai, Lord, for both Yahuwah and Yahusha to muddy the waters plus they added a verse on purpose that was not in the original greek manuscripts of um i think it was matthew or mark i'm trying to remember i will put the video in, in the description of this for you the link um so we have deception all around um it's a very polytheistic view to have three gods as one god right and just think and that's what leads me to um which leads me to yahusha not being Yahuwah. <laughs> um, so we have, we have this idea. And if you really just want to boil it down into terms, let's say somebody who'd never heard any of this before, you're like, yeah, God's eternal and he doesn't change. That's what scripture says. And his word's eternal. But even though he's eternal and his word's eternal, he died and his part of his word got done away with kind of alluding to the fact that it was imperfect, but really not. And kind of like this Jesus guy, he was like God, but also a man. But when he died on the cross, there's this thing called the hypostatic union. And he wasn't God in that moment. And just like the man of him died. And then like he raised himself from the dead because he was like somehow God again. And I'm like the mental gymnastics to make this be true. If you really, like, if you get outside religious indoctrination, you can step outside of it for a second, be intellectually honest, and look at it for what it is. It's an atrocity. And it's a lie. It's a doctrine of demons. And it's causing us, here's how good Satan is. He wants us out of covenant with our Heavenly Father so badly that he has made a false, lawless, demigod Messiah that we worship in error as Yahuwah God, thus committing idolatry thinking that we're doing exactly what he wants us to do like evil genius right that is matthew 7 lord lord we did all these things in your name we did christmas we did easter we believe in the divinity of christ we cast out demons in the name of jesus we did all this stuff and he's like i never knew you why that's covenant language folks we weren't in covenant with him he did not know us because we did not know him. We followed after a false 
version. Okay? So, Yahushua Messiah, I truly believe, and I believe that scripture supports, was an anointed and appointed man, a prophet like unto Moses, who fulfilled the greatest call. I mean, this is miraculous. And I think it makes it even more so that he wasn't half God and like had some extra help, right? He came to be our example. So I don't believe he was the logos in the flesh. I believe that he was the embodiment of what it means to live out the logos, the word of Yahuwah, which was there from the beginning. Yahusha was the embodiment of living the word with the correct heart intention and our example here on earth. And he didn't say ever follow me. He, or he didn't say worship me. He said, follow me. Right? Right? You will never see the way Yahuwah commands worship and gives us the loving instructions on how to love him and worship him and love people, which is the whole Torah on the two commandments, love God and love people, hang all the rest of the commandments, all the other 613. And so <laughs> you, you have this twisted version. And I believe that Jesus, the pagan demigod lawless messiah who nailed his own word to the cross to set us free from the dirty old burdensome law that is the antichrist folks that might hurt your feelings a little bit because you might have come out of some really bad situations in the name of jesus and that's just you who is grace and mercy because <laughs> he can even use our ignorance and our incorrect things to steer us towards truth. But I can tell you that Jesus isn't the truth. It's Yahushua Messiah that died as a covenant blood for the atonement of sins if and only if we repent and walk in covenant. You can't apply the blood of the covenant to your sin if you're not walking in the covenant, folks. And that is the kicker. And that's what Satan is banking on you, not understanding and not doing and not knowing. And that you will get to that, you know, you'll, you'll get to the point where he says, I never knew you. And you're like, wait, hold up. I did all the things just like you said. And he's like, no, you didn't. Destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I don't want that for people. That makes me angry that Satan can do that. That makes me angry that I fell for it. It makes me angry that friends and family and people I love are still falling for it. And that is why I have to share. And you, you can believe it or not, I can't make you believe it. What I pray is, Father Yahuwah in heaven, B'Shem Yahusha HaMashiach, in the name of Yahusha our Messiah, I ask you to bring a revelation of Torah written on our hearts, because that is the renewed covenant. And we cannot be in that renewed covenant with the blood of the covenant, Messiah's blood, applied to our sin if we don't have a revelation of that and we don't start walking in it. So I'm asking for that revelation of Torah written on our hearts and the renewed covenant to become evident to people. And that they would have that desire to walk in that covenant and live rightly with you and understand who you are and who Yahusha is and what the Ruach is, an agent of you. Not you projected onto things, but an agent, your spirit, your, your entity that enables us to want to and to walk in the commandments out of loving obedience. I pray that for people. I pray that repentance would be granted to people now and continually to me now for the things that we are still led astray in and need to unlearn. And so it's only repentance that accesses Messiah's blood and applies that covenant blood to our sins so that the penalty is canceled. What we're not under anymore is the penalty of the Torah for transgressing Torah, which is the only definition for sin in the entire Bible is transgression against the Torah. That's sin. And if that's done away with, then we can't sin. And we don't even need Messiah, right? Do whatever we want. And that's the point. <laughs> like, Satan wants us to be God of selves and zero accountability to the Father and the scriptures. But this is, the covenant walk is one of accountability and it's one of us willfully, joyfully, lovingly, not burdensome. Okay, for this we know that we love the children of Yahuwah, right? That we walk in the commandments for this is the love of Yahuwah, that we guard the commandments and they are not burdensome. That's in John. 
anything calling the commandments burdensome is a lie, folks. A doctrine of demons, folks. And there's pastors from the pulpit teaching this that don't even know that they're a tool of the enemy. They don't even know they're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They don't even know. Because of ignorance. Which just means a lack of knowledge. And that's what we're destroyed for. So, Yahushua Messiah is a man, or was a man, okay? He followed Yahuwah obediently. He preached repentance. And he answered the call on his life unto death. And that's our example. And that's the standard. That's the bar. That's what we're to be doing. Right? And if all things are possible with Yahuwah, with God, aren't keeping the commandments possible? Hmm? Unless that doesn't mean all. Unless it's only some things that you're comfortable with. Ah, that's heart circumcising thought right there. Right? And then he was resurrected. Messiah was resurrected by the same rock, by the same set apart Holy Spirit that we will be someday. This is why studying the feast is a big deal. Messiah was the first fruit, study the feast of first fruits of the resurrection. And there's two actually resurrections. If you read scripture, Revelation talks about it. Other places talk about it in the prophets. The first resurrection are those worthy of ruling and reigning with Messiah as a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? And that happens at the second coming. Because Messiah has been death, burial, resurrection by the Ruach. He is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. Um, and what I believe the tabernacle, the blueprint, it says in scripture um, of the heavenly tabernacle. So however that exactly looks, um, you know, and I'm studying that right now. Um, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is divine in nature in some way at this point, but still not Yahuwah. Deuteronomy says Yahuwah is one. He stands alone. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Echad, unified in purpose. Same way a husband and wife are Echad, unified in purpose, but not the same entity. It's not one God in three persons. Okay? And so, oh, I must forget where I was going with that because I like get so passionate about stuff. But anyway, okay, Feast of First Fruits, all that stuff. Um, and so when Messiah comes back, the first resurrection will happen at the second coming. And those worthy of the first resurrection will rule and reign with Messiah. Torah. Torah is going to be what he rules and reigns by, guys. That's why this says this is types and shadows. It means it's rehearsal. This life is rehearsal. Be sanctified. Be set apart. <clears throat> learn how to be somebody Yahuwah wants to spend forever with. Um, learn how to live in covenant and love him. And love people the biblical way, not the worldly way. And then hopefully be worthy of that first resurrection upon which the second death has no power. And then the second resurrection happens and the day of judgment. So atonement, study that feast. You can study trumpets, atonement, all that, right? For Messiah's return. And uh, and that, sec that second resurrection and the judgment that happens. And what's the standard for righteousness? In scripture, it's Torah. What are we going to be judged by at judgment if we're in that second resurrection group? Torah. So what do you think we should be following now to understand it as fully as we can? The side of all that, Torah. Okay. Why do you think Satan has gone to such lengths over thousands of years? To get people to believe that Torah no longer matters. There is nowhere in scripture it says that Messiah nailed the instructions to the cross. Even the cross is in question. It's an occult symbol of antiquity. What exactly, how exactly did Messiah die? Oh, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are ready for that. And I don't know that I'm ready to talk about it because I'm still very much new at studying that. But um, it doesn't make him any less Messiah to be a man. Prophecy said not that God would come in the flesh, but that Messiah would come in the flesh, right? And he did. And he lived that sinless life and he became the blood of atonement for sin. Yahuwah forgives sin. Yahusha, Messiah, is the blood of the covenant for the forgiveness of sins, but he doesn't forgive your sins. Yahuwah does. The owner of the covenant forgives your sins. That's Yahuwah. Um... 
and he's able to do that. And that blood's able to be applied because of Messiah. So that is an absolute miracle. And then the fact that he was the first fruit of the resurrection, the first one to be raised from the dead by the Ruach, as we will be someday, as some of us will be someday, whether it's the first or the second, is so, so cool. And now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. I mean, he's our intercessor. He's our high priest. The order of the priesthood and the sacrificial system are the two things that changed with the renewed covenant. And the renewed covenant simply is, instead of it being on tablets of stone, it's written on our hearts. And unless we have a revelation of Torah written on our hearts and a desire to walk in that rightly, we are not in the renewed covenant, guys. Because that blood of the covenant cannot be applied if we're not in the covenant. And that's what Satan wants to get you on. I do believe. I don't know. This is 30 minutes. Take and test it. I pray that he opens eyes and hearts to receive his truth. Psalm 119, 142. Your Torah, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is truth. Test everything, friends. Shalom.